Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast, where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. Today, we have an interview with Janice Liedel, our colleague at Laurentian University. Janice is a professor of history and teaches and researches in English and European history, as well as writing on pop culture and history. She's co-edited The Hobbit in History and Star Wars in History and contributed to Harry Potter in History and Twilight in History, along with her numerous academic publications. You may see a theme here. We talked about fandoms, science fiction, Star Wars and Star Trek and how history and the study of history connect to all of it. We also hear from her dogs a bit. Well, hi, Janice. Thanks for joining us today. You're somebody who has so many ways that you connect the different interests in your life. Nothing seems to be particularly off limits in terms of saying, hey, I could make that be interesting in a different part of my life. So I thought that would be something we could talk to you about because it's something, as you know, that interests us. Sure. The thing that comes to mind immediately when I think of you is the combination of fandom and academia. And it's honestly the the case that I came to academia, at least to academic history, a lot later than I did with fandom, like most people. And so if I you know, think back to how I want to sometimes explain things or connect things to people, I usually start with some sort of fandom I think we'll have in common. What sort of things were you fan of earliest on? What were your earliest fandoms? Oh my goodness. My earliest fandoms were definitely in literary science fiction and fantasy. I was a fan of Tolkien from way back, thus our okay. connection with The Hobbit and history. But I was I also a fan <laughs> of all sorts of literary science fiction, like Asimov, some of Dune, all of that, and, and media science fiction, and to a lesser extent, fantasy, because this was back in the 70s and 80s, when there were pretty slim pickings at times. But it was a lot of fun to read and be a part of. I was in science fiction clubs and I published fan writings and did fan art. I went to conventions. I even went to uh, a world con when I was still just 17 years old. So like I said, wow. fandom, fandom kind of predates a lot of my historical interests. Yeah, so you were right. I mean, I, I read those things you're talking about, and I liked that kind of stuff, but I was never really in fandom that way. I wasn't a fan in that sense. I never did zines or cons or any of that stuff, so you were into it. <laughs> that, that's true. And so coming from that background, that sense of community, that sense of connection was pretty, uh, pretty fun to do in a lot of ways. I, if I could have come up with a way to sort of do my whole life around that, I, I might have. But it was always more fun, I thought, to look at the ways in which those communities and those interests connected further and deeper. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting that, you know, you start off in a very, what is at least on the surface, a very future looking area of fandom with the sci-fi. And at first glance, one might make the assumption, well, what does that have to do with history? But of course, as you've pointed out many times, there is a very deep connection there. Oh, yes. I mean, whether you want to look at the long history of science fiction style writings, going back to people like Margaret Cavendish, who was writing in the 17th century, what a lot of people have identified as some of the first science fiction, or go back even earlier, obviously, to Antiquity antiquity and some of the yeah. speculative stories there. But there's also the way in which those areas of, of writing and research and, and speculation build off of and borrow from the past. And it's not just the alternate history ones, but the ones that project into the future some kind of speculation about what if things worked out this way. They put it in the future, but really it's a replaying of a historical idea or a historical moment. I mean, Dune is very obviously that in lots of ways. It plays with really old stuff, puts it in the future, but makes it ancient. It's weird. Time in Dune is very strange. <laughs> That's true. But as you're right, you know, you've got the connections with the great families. They're vying for power in the imperial court, the control of trade routes. And all of this yeah. we could pull right out of elements of ancient history, the medieval world, or looking beyond a lot of the Eurocentric areas going into the world history as well. 
Yeah, because of all the desert stuff. But then also, I mean, the fact that it's the Atreides, the family is the Atreides, and that those strange dream visions of the actual Agamemnon family history. I haven't read Dune in a while, but I do remember he has moments of sort of going back through his past lives all the way back to the actual Atreidae. Yeah. Yes, science fiction and the, the fantasy, the, the great epics, the sweep of those were always an awful lot of fun for me. And as I said, the communities that built up around that with people. And people people who are interested. I mean, the thing about fandom that I think really connects to academia is true fandom, like what or in-depth stuff, like what you're talking about. It's not just enough to, hey, I like this text. Do you like this text? Great. We like this text together. It's a fascination with it, with wanting to know more about it, about wanting to know every element of what went into it or possible alternate stories or all of those things. That curiosity to learn more and discuss it with somebody else that is really similar. Yeah, the term that fans have borrowed from academia is to use the, they use the term meta. Let's get meta about right. supernatural or let's get meta about Star Trek. You know, they do that, as you say, they, they really dive in and they might do an analysis of the significance of colors and family allegiances and Dune. Mm -hmm. They might look at and, well, like we've seen with Star Trek, reverse engineer the languages of the Klingons yes. and the culture. That kind of deep diving, that kind of let's take it seriously and see where it goes mm -hmm. is something that's really familiar to academics. The impulse that drives you to do that with things you love in fandom is presumably very similar to the impulse that drives you to do it in academics. That I mean, because you don't start academics, most of us, to, you know, be on committees. You start it to, <laughs> though that might be the end result for a lot of people, but you start it because you love the thing you're t you, and you want to keep talking and thinking about it. And you want to find other people to talk and think about it with. Precisely. And it was one of the most exciting points in my career when I proposed an essay to a collection looking at science fiction television, and this was an essay about Battlestar Galactica. Yes. It, it mm -hmm. went, they liked it. And I realized mm -hmm. that, yeah, there were other people out there who were interested in the same way I was and would take it seriously. So we could look at the meaning of history and the uses of history in what for many people is uh, just a throwaway science fiction show. But mm, that's just a pastime. Yeah, right. For some people. Mm -hmm. And of course, the big thing now in everyone's mind is The Force Awakens. And you've been thinking about that in terms of history as well. Yes, I've been posting on my blog little tidbits just drawn out of what we've seen so far in the trailer, and we've seen in some teaser images and discussions what history can tell us about what to expect when the new Star Wars movie comes out. So when Star Wars and History was first published in 2012, people referred to the long ago promise that George Lucas had made, we will have three more movies, get a final trilogy. And, right. and I said, well, then you want more Star Wars in history then. Now we aren't getting a new book, but <laughs> I can at least yeah. give you with my blog. So on my blog, I've been posting about The Force Awakens, all these teaser bits and images in the trailer. So I've got a couple pieces. I'll be doing a few more throughout the summer. Once the movies start coming out, though, I'm really ready to get my teeth into those to see a little <laughs> bit more. Maybe bring in some guest posts or connect to other bloggers who are doing the same thing, because I'm sure George Lucas made it clear he used history for the first six movies. He's certainly going to be calling out to history again in the last three. When I saw the, the second trailer, it really emphasized the, the idea of family. And of course, that made me immediately think of the Old Norse family sagas and the way that they're, the narrative arc goes over several generations where you don't have one consistent protagonist that runs all the way through. In fact, it deals with all these different generations. And so I was thinking in sort of literary terms, but I, I imagine that may also be a call out to some, to lots of historical elements as well. I think you're right. And for George Lucas, the line between history and literary studies, it's pretty broad and pretty uh, mushy. He <laughs> borrows from both. When we were preparing Star Wars in history, we had the chance to consult, to send some of our ideas about chapters and themes over to him. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and every <laughs> chapter we know he read and commented on too, which was also pretty awesome. That is very cool. So, but even before those words got on the page, as I said, 
he was giving us some ideas about what mattered and in his view, but also what he was open to. You mentioned the Norse sagas. I certainly think that's part. He also felt that ancient Egypt and its traditions uh, blended in there. And he was very fascinated with what was going on in China and Japan as well. So yes. like I said, a worldwide tidbit, there's always something more you can bring in, I think, with Star Wars. Yeah, people focus so much on the myth aspects, the Joseph Campbell stuff in the first trilogy, which is there and obvious and I mean, it's been gone over lots and he's acknowledged that explicitly. But I think that there's the second trilogy, for all its flaws, definitely has clear links to particular historical things that I think are really interesting, even if they're not always developed in exactly the way I would have wanted them to be. But for a lot of people now, the, our students, that's their Star Wars. That's the one they grew up with, which is strange to think about, but <laughs> that, that's the reference points, right? I mean, they watched Anakin on a, on a pod racer, and that was their first Star Wars they saw. So those connections can be useful in class too, not just fun to talk about, which they are, but as you say, trying to make those connections for your students so that they can understand stuff. And always trying to keep them up to date. You're right that for a lot of students, they might remember more about Anakin Skywalker than Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was the generation that they're in. And I'm sure that you guys have the same experience that I do, that all of a sudden that pop culture reference you would make in the classroom all of a sudden goes out of date very quickly. Yeah. For example, when I would teach ancient Near Eastern history, I'd start off my pre-dynastic Egypt with images of the rock from, right, from the Scorpion the mummy. King and the Mummy. Yes, yeah. those movies. <laughs> and for a couple of years, that was awesome. And then I got this blank look at the screen. What was that? So I realized I had to get with the times, contemporize. Yeah. Some things, some things are so good and so classic that they hang around, but a lot of pop culture is pretty transient. In classics, we get the bump from the various movies. So when Gladiator came out, suddenly there were tons of people coming to Roman and Civ classes and Roman history classes because they were so fascinated by Gladiators. But then five years later, even though Gladiator is a pretty big movie, then people do remember it. But still, Gladiator means nothing to my students now. Now it's 300 and Sparta, but even that's already a few years past. I'm not good at keeping up and I have to try pretty hard actually to remember to watch some of the stuff that comes out when there's bunches of stuff that's relevant to what I teach. I certainly noticed that with Lord of the Rings, that there yeah. was a big interest in medieval literature, especially after the, the Lord of the Rings. I wasn't teaching as much of that around the Hobbit movie, so I, I didn't notice it, but... yeah. But then it can pass too, because of course, we are always getting new students who are in the new crop. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So everything's got to be new again. And it's it's fun to see how these things are rewoven and reiterated. Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones has been another area I've been working with a lot. And so many yeah, students yeah. will say, oh, you know, I, I want to know more about this because of Game of Thrones. Um, they want to talk about Hadrian's Wall, or they want to talk about 15th century English queens and how they were kind of like Cersei Lannister. And I say, not quite as extreme as she, but you know, you're on the right track. So that is the, the yeah. wonderful thing. But it's a real daunting challenge to try to keep on top of all of that, along with everything else you want to be reading and researching and writing about yourself, right? Yeah, especially since we've got little kids, some of the movies that have come out that are classical or medieval in theme are not really ones we can watch with a four-year-old. Our kids watch some stuff that's not really age appropriate, but there are some limits. Game of Thrones is not going on the television in front of my four-year-old. And I have <laughs> so to admit, I, I fast forward through an awful lot of it. I find it yeah. too gory and too upsetting for me. Yeah. There are other fanish shows out there. A lot of people are very interested in things like The Walking Dead, for example. Yes. Yeah. And I, I wish them luck. They can research that and write about that, talk <laughs> about that. But literally just the commercials give me nightmares. So I'm not brave yeah. enough yeah. for that show. No, I read Game of Thrones, but I haven't watched it. And part of it, part of it is, as I say, it's hard to find a time to, to squeeze it in when it's not something we can have on when the kids are up. But also I am pretty weak stomached about violence and, you know, sexual violence and things like that. And it was hard enough reading the books. I don't think I need to watch it. That said, you know, I'm, I'm glad my students are enjoying it and I want to, I'm glad that I've read it because then at least I know that the stories are diverging now. So I'm going to have less and less understanding what's happening, but <laughs> I do 
you know the world of it so I can feel like I'm vaguely up to date with it because that comes up even though it's medieval it certainly comes up in our classes in the classics courses I teach oh yes just because everybody's watching it and yeah. there, there's enough that George R. R. Martin said he wasn't just trying to recreate some bits of history here and there he was borrowing widely again and mm -hmm. you go back mm -hmm. to Roman history I'd say in particular and you can't escape an awful lot of parallels John reminds me of some really bad boy emperors who were out there, <laughs> the bad ends that they met too. Yeah, well, I remember you gave a, a talk that I was at, I, and I think you were looking at some of the Caligula and Nero parallels, but also the Roman women, Roman empresses. Yeah. So, I mean, Cersei, I think in some ways is a lot more like the popular perceptions anyway of some of those Roman women in the Augustan era than she is like a medieval queen. It's actually more like Livia in some ways. I, I think so, yes, in terms of both the uh, sometimes the liberties of action that she could take mm -hmm. and the really yeah. destructive world of the court. Yeah, not saying that Livia or Agrippina were really like that, but like Agrippina, uh, Claudia's wife, in particular with the sexual proclivities and then of course you go to the incest stuff, that's Roman. There's a lot of stuff about uh, brother-sister incest in the Roman royal court. Whether it happened or not, it's that's the gossip and that's where you can draw on those stories from so yeah. definitely i wanted to to make sure we did talk a little more about those and history books mm -hmm. because as you mentioned we we contributed a chapter for the hobbit in history right yes i mean your your chapter on the hobbit in history kind of perfectly showcases why we could reach across a long range of history to a lot of different mm -hmm. examples from antiquity through the Middle Ages to see yeah. how this pop culture moment, how those kings in The Hobbit uh, and in Tolkien's world in general were beings that he could create borrowing off of all of that rich past. Yeah, we all look at the Tolkien and think of medieval history. Yeah. And that's the obvious place. And of course, he's a medievalist. He I almost think of him first as a as a scholar mm -hmm. because of his, his importance to Anglo the study of Anglo-Saxon literature in the 20th century is really founded on his work. Mm -hmm. But he's an educated man from the period he's from. He knows everything classical too. There's no way that that's not there. So that was kind of fun to, that was a lot of fun to do that chapter mm. actually. It was fun because we got to work together, which we don't always get to do. That's true. Um, it, w it had to be nice for you guys to say, hey, finally a way to connect our, <laughs> our research interests and our ideas all in you know, one yeah. credit. Yeah, well, exactly, because as you know well, the problem, the good thing about academics is how much you get to deep dive into your own specialty subject, but the bad thing about it is how much you get to only think about your own subject. <laughs> so even though Mark and I, to the outside world, probably seem very similar in our interests, both do old stuff and languages <laughs> and Latin, right? I mean, that's the same. Yeah. But in fact, academically, we very we really never get to work on the same stuff because we're different periods and we're different departments. And that's that. That's how things work most of the time. And I do think it's really productive and exciting when you do get the opportunity to do something that wanders a bit. Yeah, it takes you into some new directions. It challenges you to start thinking about different kind of research, different kind of resources to work with as well. And you have, instead of having the same conversations, I mean, that's a trap you can get into when you talk to people in your own field, you have the same conversations again, you talk about the same subject. So when I talk about, if I talk about emperors and the concept of leadership in the ancient world, the people I'm talking to all pretty much learned the same things from the same texts that I do, and they will play their part in the conversation and say the same things. And we'll just, it, it's preaching to the choir. We both know what we're talking about already. But then if I talk to Mark, I have my assumptions about the medieval world, and then they're wrong. And that's good, because that means I'm actually learning something and vice versa, I presume. Yeah. And so when we're starting to bring in new resources and new material, and a very whiny dog all of a sudden, I was feeling lonely. Um, but what would you like to contribute? What are your connections, dog? Yeah, what your what connections do you see you? as important? You're, you're a German dog, so you want to see more German resources and German history. And <laughs> that would be, but also anything involving a ball would do. Right. That reminds me, I gave you a set question and I I meant to ask it early so that we didn't talk about whatever you were going to say before we did. There so, we go. <laughs> so why don't we, why don't I ask you that? So I had said that I was going to ask you, 
Can you tell us about an interesting connection within your field of interest, a link that affects the way you think about the world or was helpful or surprising or led you in a new direction or an interconnection between two parts of your life that had unexpected results? Well, I'll throw in one that I think is really interesting and still resonates for me today more than 20 years after I first ran across it. When I was researching for my dissertation back in the late 1980s, I ran across the mention of a woman who was convicted of treason by an act of parliament on the basis of an embroidered tunic. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, that by itself <laughs> is pretty weird. It's actually a fairly famous case. This was the treason of Margaret Pohl, who was a cousin to Henry VIII. She's convicted. Oh. Yeah, now, now some of the names are, are making those connections. She's convicted of treason, as I said, on the basis of this embroidered surcoat. And I'd been researching politics and political texts in the time of Henry VIII for my research. It didn't exactly 100% fit in there, an embroidery in the midst of all that, but I put it aside and came back to it several years later and just got more and more interesting because I realized it wasn't just the embroidery, but it was the interpretation of the embroidery that made her conviction happen. So somebody didn't just walk in and say, look at this tunic, she's guilty of treason, but they had to explain it. And the way you, right, they had to do a critical analysis. Of precisely. It, so you have Thomas Cromwell, and you might know him from the mm -hmm. popular recent show Wolf Hall, based on that bestseller right. book. Thomas Cromwell comes into Parliament in 1539, and he says, this tunic proves that Margaret Pole was planning to marry her son, Reginald, who had just become a cardinal in the Catholic Church that's on the outs with England. He wants to marry Reginald off to King Henry's now illegitimate daughter, Mary. And it's all proved because if you see, look at these pansies here embroidered on this tunic. They symbolize <laughs> Reginald. Look at these, uh, yeah, look at these marigolds for Mary. And then here are... Oh. Here's the arms of England as well. And so that means that they're trying to take the throne of England. It's all of these other little elaborate details. And I went right. digging around in a, a lot of archival sources. I went through all of the household goods that were inventoried when she was first arrested to try to find this tunic. It doesn't show up there. So my suspicion is that tunic might have been with related to her household. Maybe it was in the church or the chapel. Because it sounds to me, they describe it of white silk with embroidery. It sounds more like church vestments. It sounds like something, something yeah. yeah, it sounds like something that a churchman would have. So I'm thinking maybe they're not just having an embroidered tunic. Maybe they're embroidering the truth about the tunic. It really strikes me. Oh. <laughs> This woman was framed. Nice. They sought desperately to come up with a way to convict her of treason because as Countess of Salisbury, Margaret Pole was one of the greatest landowners in England in the 1530s. Uh. She owned a lot of property where an invading army that the English were sure was going to come. She owned a lot of property right. they might land on. And so right. with all of those things together, she poses a serious threat, even though she's an elderly lady who can legitimately say, I've spoken nothing against the king. I've all, you know, she has always watched her language. I've told my sons to be good to the king. They couldn't prove it until they come up with this embroidery and use it to frame the countess for treason and eventually get her executed. That's fascinating. Yeah, that kind of interest connected a lot of other things. And I've continued on with uh, looking at some aspects of, you know, how are things depicted? What's the difference between the reality and that kind of uh, story people are telling about the past? The construction of the story. Yes. As you say, a kind of a critical analysis had to be applied. It's very interesting. And if you look back in history, you can see an awful lot of cases where people lose their lives over such really sort of thinly veiled stories. So I research in crime history and crime records, and I find a lot of testimonies and a lot of prosecutions are very at odds with everybody's creating their own stories, referring to the same evidence, referring to the, you know, the same justifications, and yet putting it in very different depictions, depending on whether you are the prosecutor and the victim, 
or whether you are the defendant who's accused of the crime. So that became something that you found led you to a, a lot of different research subjects that were not what you really started with necessarily. Yeah. So I started I started with the Tudor history and I do a lot, I do hundreds of years later and I do lots of different kinds of history mm -hmm. just based upon this one reference to right. a right. conviction. This woman is attained of treason in parliament based on her embroidery. You pull on a thread and see what... <laughs> What happens? Yeah, if you want to say the endless knot <laughs> might have a few stitches <laughs> going through it too. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, I, I, I'm immediately struck by the fact that, of course, it's a textile. It's a text. I mean, yeah. that textile text link, which is there in the in the language, but is, is played with uh, so much in the texts, if you'll excuse the term, that I study all the poetry and things. The idea that a woman is convicted on the basis of her yeah. womanly actions, the thing that she does that is completely appropriate. She embroiders a garment for her son. Or, or for her churchman or for her churchman an absolutely appropriate domestic activity for a woman and yet it's subversive i mean it makes me think of the madame defarge stuff with knitting it makes me think of um, there's a classical text i'm sure you know of philomela and procne where a woman is raped and has her tongue cut out so she can't say accuse her her rapist and to tell the story, she embroiders it into a tapestry. Well, she weaves, she weaves it, into, it a into a tapestry a ta and then sends it to her sister, the wife of the of the man who assaulted her. And she learns about it through that. And then they come up with a plan to uh, kill the man's child and feed it to him because it's Greek myth. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but there again, you have this this association of it's a perfectly sensible. She's allowed to do the weaving because that's what women do, even though she's held in captivity. But it's subverted in some way that it, it goes against power in that case sort of to her benefit though everybody's turned into birds in the end so i don't know who wins or the old norse example of a woman making a shirt with oh, a yeah. neckline that's too low being grounds for divorce because it implies homosexuality yeah so she makes for her husband a shirt, a shirt. which is what she's supposed mm -hmm. to do but if she makes the neckline too low she imputes a, a wrong characteristic to mm -hmm. him and so he can divorce her right yeah. yeah, this is exactly the kind of thing that there's a really rich other story to all these mm -hmm. everyday or, as you say, perfectly acceptable activities that women could do in the past. We might not hear about these women otherwise in the courts and the official yeah. records, but we see them all of a sudden when their very normal activities become the, the passage in to a really abnormal activity, an assault, a case of treason, or impugning somebody's sexual honor yeah and so that we but we also see uh as you say i mean if, if especially if this was a trumped up charge you see the masculine world trying to trying to find a way to use right you know she you said she was so careful she was so careful to do all the things she was supposed to do yeah but they still they wanted to find something against her and so they turn her own the things they made her do as it were you know the things that a woman is supposed to do and is forced into the only sphere she's allowed to have in that period theoretically though i know that there were women who certainly did more than just sit at home and embroider at that time <laughs> but the sphere that she's supposed to be in she's being all safe and that they still have to find a way to turn that against her right and one of the phrases that her very exasperated interrogators used he called her rather a strong and constant man than a woman mm -hmm. because she just withstood all of their questions she didn't break down she didn't give them anything at all they could work with right oh how dare she yeah yes <laughs> Yeah, so no, that's the word. That's what the term virago was coined to do, right? For, How dare a woman look like a man or act like a man? <laughs> precisely. And so it, mm -hmm. when the issues, I mean, we talk in academia, we use the word gender a lot. We're talking about gender issues and gender differences. And I can see sometimes my students turning, tuning out, they find the word a little bit confusing and off-putting. But if I say something like, Look at how this woman is being described, you know, as you say, a virago, she's being put down because she's behaving like a man. They get that and all of a sudden they can become much more sympathetic and energized to look at the problems that these historical men and women face. And we're going, yeah, now you're getting something of gender history with that. Yeah. And then looking and saying, well, the action that she's doing is not in and of itself a negative action. She's being strong under cross-examination. Yeah. Why is that negative in this case? What is it about her that makes that a negative quality? And then you can lead them through realizing, oh, it's because it's misgendered in their view. Right. 
in the in the prosecutor's view. And, you know, I, I like that kind of uh, example because I, I agree, my students sometimes, people feel like, oh, all you're going to do is go through history and point out how oppressed women were. Personally, I find that a very boring <laughs> thing to do because, yes, of course they were. Ooh, look, this period was patriarchal too. Yeah. Ooh, look, yeah, that period end. was patriarchal too. <laughs> it doesn't get you anywhere. No. Very short lecture. Yeah, it's kind of just a, a truism. And again, yeah, we all know that, but Let's find ways to say, pull out new interpretations and new understandings and new thoughts from that very old cloth, I guess, we're still working yeah. with. <laughs> with our, yeah, keeping to keep with our textile metaphor yeah and also to look at how what we're not, what we're doing is not saying oh they were horrible then and we're lovely now because i have it's disturbing how often i see that narrative in my students they like to look at the ancient world and say look how bad they were to their women but now everything's fine because we all have equal rights precisely the middle ages is the same <laughs> comfortable yeah. distance we can say well, yeah. everybody in the Middle Ages was oppressed and sad, and now everybody in the 21st century is cool and liberated. And yeah. the truth is something a lot different now, isn't it? So mm -hmm. being able to get rid of, in history, we call it the Whig interpretation of history, that everybody's progressing to a wonderful modern oh, day. Yes, right, um, right. The myth of progress in general. Yeah. yeah, to put that aside and say, you know, we're always changing and we've always got some elements that are going to be in there. And it's looking for that particular mix of change and continuity that makes history for whatever period a lot of fun. And also, like I said, makes a lot of fodder for the fandom, too. Yes, absolutely. Because that's, I mean, you could get into the whole question of why people like the sort of historic historicized fantasy i don't know if you want to call it historical fantasy like game of thrones which uh, is so popular now mm -hmm. oh my goodness yes and like tolkien in its own way and, mm -hmm. and also like a certain i mean i think about stuff i enjoyed from this sort of soft science fiction side though i have problems with the author now the dark over series that i liked when i was growing up uh which is one of these things set in the future technically but it's a planet that's forgotten its technology and reverted to a kind of past so it's doing that thing of exploring a, a what if of the historical world or just basically setting it in the historical period but then get into whatever it wants because there's no actual historical narrative that it has to be faithful to so it's not like historical fiction right and i think i think that the talking about both the sense of othering of wanting to say they're all different and isn't it fun and exotic to explore that but also the but we're always the same and there's no necessary progress we're not necessarily better than them or more advanced it's some tension between those two things that makes people so fascinated by that kind of fiction and films i think but i, I mean i that's a big topic yeah that they, you you can do more than just use history to predict what will happen but you can use that history to say well how do people react to these kind of pressures? How does that give me a jumping off point for the mm -hmm. fantastical alternatives I want to be exploring? Um, but yeah, I, I know the Dark Over books too, and I was a, a super big fan in the day. And I agree with you, they're mm -hmm. problematic today for a lot of other reasons to do with the author. But still, what's in there is so important is that Marion Zimmer Bradley helped to create a world that was founded as much upon women, upon mm -hmm. interesting ideas of relationships and sexuality that came out of this. It represents a branching off within science fiction to yeah. really delve into that social science. And that's that's still important. We can't ignore that and we need yeah. to, to credit that and say that's that helped to shape the 21st it century. It shifted things. Yeah. She, yeah, absolutely. It shifted things a lot in terms of how science fiction went from the from the Asimov and Zelazny and you know kind of world which was good but much as I loved Asimov mm -hmm. rereading some of the foundation books and going really you know we're having women still talking about their hats and gloves yeah you yeah know, it, as it, if that that blew my mind everything progresses except this you know except these gender relations never change but you know everything else in the world has changed completely but we're still yeah. so, women still cook dinner you know it's just like, really yeah it's but it's, of course that i mean that's something that's true about that's often true about science fiction is yeah. that they really are just projecting today yeah they are reflecting the the world that they're written in mm -hmm. as much as anything else. Yeah, well, in the Dark Over series is always interesting for that because it's such a response to coming out of first wave 
feminism so strongly so and then it changes as you go through her the period because it starts off with the only happy world for women is one that excludes men entirely <laughs> that's the only way to do it in in some of the you know some of the amazon dark over amazon books that's really the only way because it is absolutely so impossible for women and men to coexist in a way that is not oppressive to women but then there's a progress as you read through from the books that go from the 70s to the 80s and into the 90s, things don't always change in the direction I would want them to necessarily, but into a much more second wave feminism or a re reinterpretation of that saying, not that all first wave feminism was, yeah. let's exclude men. You and <laughs> I'm not saying that, of course, but you know, there was a strain of that. There was an, oh my God, the only way we can possibly have a, an equal world is to just set up an island by ourselves. That's the only way it's going to happen. And then there's a, wait, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how things work. And a re-examination of that and you can see all of that even though the, her books are set in right. the future you can see the progression of feminist thought from the 70s through the 90s mapped out almost perfectly in her books and it's just such a good example of how science fiction is one of the best ways i think of tracking of tracking yeah, present socialized. social mores yeah, yeah. <laughs> even better than than actual modern fiction because modern fiction is so much more mm -hmm. individualized it's mm -hmm. about a single person mm -hmm. and so their interaction with the world is always so based mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. that individual person and can be very different of course it works too but but science fiction is always about like a whole society and so the way that whole society is built is such a good reflection of the society in which the author is star trek works really well yeah. for that because yeah. you look at the 1960s episodes yeah. and then you look at the you know 1980s, 1980s episodes. and 90s and you can see how it's always reflecting right concerns yeah. yeah they did it explicitly of course but mm -hmm. i mean they would intentionally yeah, very intentionally yeah. Yeah. I, I think that star trek makes yeah. such a, a wonderful example the one regret i have professionally is that when we were putting out the series star trek and history i was so busy doing editorial work for star wars and history i didn't have a chance to participate <laughs> it was uh, you know, a huge uh, number of people threw their hats into the ring for that particular volume as well. We literally had 70 or 80 good candidates that we could have put into that book. But Nancy Reagan, who co-edited Hobbit and History and Star Wars and History with me, was running this volume alone. Well, we couldn't put that many in, you know, and she had to make some really hard choices. Yeah, and she right. said, Star Trek still really resonates for so many people because the history that it used from that time period, it's such an exciting period of history it was in, and the way that it, they used history mm -hmm. still amazes us today. Yeah, and it becomes its own interesting subject to look at what topics they pick up on, which directions they go, what the utopian ideal about that subject is at any moment. You know, what is the utopian idea about gender relations yes. in 1967 as opposed to what is the utopian ideal about gender relations in 1989 or you know that's because it's utopian it it also gives us a what do we think is what or what did some people think was the peak of, of possible progress for our culture what was the thing we were aiming at which is always really interesting to know yeah about and star that. trek because it's been around for so long and now we even have the reboot movies as everybody's saying giving us a yeah, 21st century star trek experience with the same characters but in very new situations I, I think it's going to continue to be pretty rich fodder veins to mine maybe for future yeah. historians <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the new ones are going to be an interesting reflection when people look back because what they aren't, one of the things that people are annoyed about, some people are annoyed about them, is how non-utopian they are. Precisely. The world of the yeah. new Star Trek reboots is not nearly as utopian they as don't the, have that that sort of vision that um roddenberry yeah of had when we get past all our problems and can have fixed them how will we interact with the rest of the universe that's not really there and so i mean uh, you talked about the walking dead and there's breaking bad and all those things the dystopic present is a really big thing right now i think that's one of the major trends in pop fiction pop culture right now is not dystopian futures so much as dystopian nows the walking dead and things like that are set basically now yes. and you know with maybe a few years in the future but they're not there's nothing no technological change nothing has happened that's changed the world and that's sort of what the star trek is reflecting now they're not showing us what's the ideal but they've got these sort of semi-anti-heroes and dystopians and i think that's going to be really interesting to look back on I mean, we can look at it now but it'll be interesting to compare in that long stretch of star trek history 
the history of Star Trek. I think you're right. And I mean, to toss it back into history as well, the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes is the guy who famously coined yeah. the phrase, mm -hmm. life is nasty, brutish, and short. And I mm -hmm. think he was writing in a really dystopic present for himself, i.e. the time of the civil wars in Britain, where a king would be executed, where there are thousands of people killing, you know, neighbors and family members over this dispute. I mean, that's pretty dystopic now for a couple hundred years ago. And it inspired some pretty dystopic thinking and literature and writing. And I think you're right today in the early 21st century with economic recessions, with wars spouting up worldwide, with the specter of terrorism or computer oversight always in the back of people's minds. It's not surprising. Yeah, yeah, the dystopic now and turning to our literature and our shows to explain what's going on right now and not just the past there might be drawing from is going to be the other big challenge. Yeah, it's good. And it's interesting because it just what the response, the cultural response is, because there were certainly lots of problems in the 60s and 70s. And the response then, at least from Roddenberry, was a utopian one. Right. Now there's similarly many quite terrifying problems, but the response appears to be a dystopic one. That's partly probably just a pendulum thing. You go back and forth between extremes. But I, you know, this kind of social and, and almost psychological history isn't my forte, but I do think it's fascinating to watch. And even if you only pick out the one or two little pop culture things that I know more about, I think it's really interesting to look at. That's true. Well, I don't want to keep you for too long because we've had you on the phone for a while now. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I'm going to have to do my daily walk with the dog. She's waiting for it yes. pretty patiently, <laughs> but she knows her time and her schedule. Well, why don't we wrap up then? Is there anything you're working on right now that you want to let us know about? I know you were talking to the CBC about your work on was 18th century women and your research is in the Old Bailey. Yeah, I am working on history of crime, women and how they invoke and protect their reputations in criminal courts, whether they're prosecutors who are going after somebody who's done harm to them, or they're vi they might be victims as well, defended, but also uh, the people who are accused of crime. So I'm spending a lot of time with these trial records, these, you wouldn't quite call them transcripts, but accounts of the trials, as well as some of the other That's records. Them, yeah, yeah uh, sometimes when people are convicted, they would speak to the churchman in charge of Newgate, and he would carry out sort of a, a little storytelling version of their confessions and their hard lives that led them to this horrible end. So right, right. I'm working with that. I've got a conference paper I'll be presenting in the fall and hopefully a little bit more. And I don't think I'm going to get tired anytime soon. There are literally thousands of trial records there from, uh, <laughs> from the old Bailey to keep going through. Yeah, it's an amazing resource to have that, the, all of those online. Yeah. I, 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 I envy you that period. <laughs> as I, I tell students, it used to be we'd have to go to one of the few libraries that had not even the original paper accounts, but microfilm accounts. You had, yeah. mm. there weren't yeah. very yeah. many copies of these. So imagine the day when you'd have to say, I'm going to be flying thousands of miles to sit and look at reels of microfilm. And that was my research, whereas now I can just fire up the computer and look at all these old Bailey trials. Yeah, it gives you a way different way of taking a different perspective on it and being able to search so much. I mean, you can just ask different questions than you had any capability of asking before. Yes. It's really interesting. And nobody can say, hey, I couldn't find any sources to do my research. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. No student is ever going to get be able to get away with that again. <laughs> no, nope, that's the downside <laughs> just, of this century. I get students occasionally saying, oh, you know, I just, there was, <laughs> there was nothing. Oh, to me. Yeah. I couldn't find anything on Catullus and JSTAR. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Let's sit down for two minutes because your problem is going to be, you're going to find too, too much. many yeah. resources. <laughs> right. You're not going to be able to sort through them. Mm -hmm. That's the difficulty. That's now the big skill. I mean, is, yeah, knowing how to, how to yeah. narrow it down. Yeah, how to use the right search terms mm -hmm. so you can find stuff, but then how to decide how to cull. I mean, that's the thing that I find so hard to, to help teach my students, and even for myself, how to cull down the immense amount of possible resources out there into the useful ones, the applicable ones, the credible ones, yeah. the absorbable in the time you have ones. Yeah. <laughs> the ones not in German. I mean, that's easy enough to get out, but <laughs> for the students anyway. So yeah, that is pretty tough, but uh, we'll keep on trekking. And I'd rather have too many resources than too few. Absolutely. So which of the And History series are still available then? 
Hobbit in History is still widely available, and you can find a lot of the other ones. Star Wars in History is currently out of print in the paper version, but you can can still get it as an ebook. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Janice. I really appreciate you uh, taking some time to chat with us. Well, it's nice it's to interesting. talk with both of you, Avon and Mark. You're such wonderful and interesting people. And like I said, I've been enjoying your new podcast as well as the video. So I can't wait to hear when I get to come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we'll put this up the second or third week of September. Sounds Time great. to start with school. I can point my students to it, too, because I always do. Uh, exactly. The videos are very helpful for my Western students. I think they'll like the podcasts, too. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Well, you go off and take those dogs for a walk, but don't stay out too long because you'll die of heat exhaustion. Yeah. Uh, I know. It will be <laughs> short, the water. hopefully back in the cool, shady basement soon. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, Janice. So you guys stay cool. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that's it for this week. For more information, check out the website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please, review it on iTunes if you can, and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. So set the picture now. There's not just an over-exuberant Rottweiler with an orange ball, but there's an elderly Sheltie who woke from her nap and didn't see me.